Good morning, everybody. This is True Seeker here. And recently I <clears throat> made a comment to a video commentary um, on somebody's voicemail. Uh, somebody uh, called in to Lloyd Evans' phone. I guess he, he set up some kind of a service and, and people can leave voicemails with him and then he offers them the ones that he feels represent the issues uh, facing Jehovah's Witnesses uh, and their struggles to deal either with the religion or leaving the, the religion. And in this particular video, there was a woman who was wanted to get out of and leave the religion. Uh, it sounded desperately. Uh, she she was. Uh, you could hear the emotion in her voice, but she didn't want to affect her husband's prospects within the organization and she was more concerned about the impacts her actions might have on her husband's than, than what would be best for her own mental and emotional welfare and I made a comment a rare comment that that uh, actually got a lot of support, which is a little unusual for me because when I make a comment, uh, most times I I'll get a little support, but uh, this one seemed to have taken off a little bit and. A lot of people seem to have liked and supported this particular comment because I opened up, and I opened up on a, on a matter that had bearing certainly on the subject, but also to something that I really haven't discussed or opened up before. Uh, I've mentioned. Uh, about the troubles that that I endured, that that <clears throat> my family endured, and and the struggles we've had as a result of being in the Bible students, forerunners of the Jehovah's Witness movement. Well, there still are Bible students for many many Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, really didn't understand or, or realize that the Bible students movement didn't disappear um, and I've made a number of videos regarding the Bible students movement and what happened and my family's experience with the watchtower going back to the early days of Charles Taze Russell and so on both sides of my family were Bible students and um, so there's been a long legacy I'm 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 a fourth generation I, I'm in my mid 60s now and I'm a fourth generation Bible student I knew many uh, individuals who were part of the Bible student movement in the early days and knew Russell. In fact, my own family knew Russell. The movement wasn't all that big in, in the early days, although it's certainly bigger than today. It's dwindling. <coughs> and um, the the Bible students culture is was one that that wasn't so terribly different from Jehovah's Witnesses they they kind of ramped up the dysfunctional elements of the Bible students but there was all of this 
there's everything that qualifies Jehovah's Witnesses as a cult that qualifies the Bible students in the same way. The shaming and uh, the, the separating from the world using the terminology, much of the, the current terminology used in the Jehovah's Witnesses really derive from the Bible students. The whole culture of separating themselves away from the world uh, in general uh, originates from the Bible students and their uh, belief that they were being selected out from the world. You are of the world, you are in the world, but not of it, was a terminology that was used by the Bible, coined by the Bible students. Many of the phrases that are used, uh, catchphrases that are used in the, in the Jehovah's Witnesses originated with the Bible students, although they modernized the language a little bit, such as the wise and faithful servant, which is the faithful and discreet say, slave. And who to whom that language applied uh, has changed over the years. Initially with the Bible students, it was Charles Taze Russell, and it still is. They idolize Russell. Uh, Russell is still, in every sense of the word, the leader of the Bible students' cult. Uh, they they qualify on the basis of their literature that that the um, only literature that's that's really valid in presenting the truth are the writings of Charles Taze Russell, and that's where the truth came from and the terminology the truth uh, you know uh, I was raised in the truth is a phraseology that that originated from the Bible students. So there's very much uh, in common. Uh, some of the things where Jehovah's Witnesses deviate is that they've taken it a little further. Uh, the, the control um, has been centralized rather than diffuse uh, throughout the ecclesia arrangement. Although the, the elders, there's a, a loose association of, of numerous Bible students, ecclesias, or congregations <coughs> that, that uh, affiliate one with the other, and they hold conventions, and they organize joint conventions, and, and um, it's very much preserving the early culture of the movement of the Watchtower and it's the days of its founder and they revere the founder um, and in most many talks you'll hear Russell's name mentioned at least once but this this poor woman uh, suffered, and I I couldn't help but think of the 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 way I was raised and the way I was brought up to think about the man being the head of the family. I had aspirations. I was I was taught that a man's worth within the Bible students was measured by whether or not he was considered um, qualified to be an elder and that was very much part of the culture whether it was spoken or unspoken it was a, it was a inferred and it was very obvious that the that the, the elders held high esteem within the structure of the the Bible students women, were secondary women were not permitted to teach or or they could comment in fact actually even in the early days of the bible student movement women usually kept quiet in the meetings um, because of a scripture let women be silent i think that was something paul said but um, women were to defer to their their husbands and their husbands uh, will 
and the children. If you, one of the qualifications for an elder laid out in the book of, I think it's Second Timothy, in the first couple of chapters, where it talks about bishops and deacons, and elders and deacons. Bible students still use the term elders and deacons. Deacon would be um, what? What are they? What are the Jehovah's Witnesses call them now? The something servant, um, ministerial servants. Those would be deacons. They hold the microphone. They lead the song service. Um, I was a, a deacon. Usually, there's a progression. A, a, a young man will be a deacon, groomed. They they give talks, and they're they're groomed to become elders. And my wife and I had a lot of troubles over the culture because she would really, even though her father was a Bible student, he was never very uh, involved in the Bible students movement. He, his jobs had taken him to places where there, there, it was more or less isolated from the Bible students. And he had, he basically was a loner. He, he read the volumes on his own. He supported the dawn. He attended a few conventions uh, here and there, mostly general conventions. Uh, when he was in the proximity of an ecclesia, he would attend. Uh, in fact, he was even an elder in, in one ecclesia. But for the most part, my wife grew up not necessarily in a secular way, but much more so than a Bible student child normally would because her mother was not a Bible student and she wanted nothing to do with the Bible students' religion. So my my wife grew up more like every other kid who's not a Jehovah's Witness or not a Bible student. And so she didn't really understand the culture so much, although her, her father had very much been in charge of that family. They were, um, he was, he, he kind of ruled, well, let's put it this way. At my father-in-law's funeral, my brother-in-law said that he ruled the family with an iron fist. So that says something there about how he had a control over the family. But he became her idol, not Charles Russell or or anything in a religious sense. He he actually didn't impose the religion very strongly on their children, on my wife and her siblings, but um, but that allowed her, when she didn't really show much interest, um, freedom to grow up in a way that most most kids in the Bible students or or. Jehovah's Witnesses wish they could have. <laughs> so that created friction between us in our marriage because I thought that I had this thinking that the man was the... I, I, am, I remember saying, I am the man. You do what I say. You know, I actually said those words, especially when she was being strong-willed or strong-headed my and my wife is a strong-headed person uh, she has very distinct very definitive way of looking at the world and nothing's going to change her and um, so I, I even thought she was probably the reason why I didn't become an elder uh, when I reached 
my early 20s because usually elder material they they the bible students are at a point where they they promote their young people as quickly as possible to be elders because they don't want to lose them for one thing and there there really aren't that many so they they want to encourage and keep them by promoting them uh, as early as the the ecclesia deems it's safe to make them a an elder without them becoming prideful or pompous you know those those types of qualifications those qual- character qualities are considered egregious within the bible students movement although um, there are an awful lot of smug elders. Uh, I can certainly uh, attest to that, that, that there are so many that are self-righteous. And that's one of the, the key issues with, with the whole organization that I, I have. They hide their humility. They're proud of their humility which isn't a real irony. So it created friction. And growing up in the family that I grew up in, it was very dysfunctional. I had no coping skills. My mother was seriously mentally ill. And um, she, I think, had some degree of schizophrenia. My brother was schizophrenic. Um, and my brother didn't fare well. I, I, I made a, a video uh, about my brother and his struggles. And, um, and I was struggling too. While I, I strove to have a family, I wanted a family, I wanted to be normal, I wanted to have all the things that, that normal people had and uh, and I and I worked hard to to get them to, to make it so but then I wasn't really well equipped either emotionally uh, to to deal with the kinds of stress and issues that that arise especially uh, under the pressure of being in the Bible students because everybody knew everybody's business. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, it was a shame-based system and because it was such a limited, and uh, there's so few Bible students, everybody knew everybody's business. And so everybody was looking over everybody's shoulder. And the the I, I began turning more and more to alcohol as the pressures of trying to deal with a family, raise a family, and support, uh, get a job, and and maintain a career, and and also um, to counter increasing resistance on my wife's part about the Bible students they she she was retracting from it she had worked from the dawn for the dawn for 10 years pretty much at my insistence but when we left the the dawn things she didn't want to have much to do with the Bible students she had had it there was so much politics, there was so much awful stuff that people did to one another uh, in, in that, in that, uh, at that place, at the dawn, that uh, it really put a bad taste in her mouth for the Bible students. And we were, we were, on our own and struggling financially and I was turning more and more to alcohol because I I didn't know how to cope I didn't know how to cope 
I didn't know really much. I was very naive in many ways because we did isolate ourselves uh, from the world. Um, I don't know if I knew anything really about counseling, but it wasn't something that I'd consider anyway because getting help from somebody in the world was not what you did as a Bible student. You you took your problems to the elders. You didn't you didn't and, and <laughs> only when they became such that you couldn't handle a situation on your own and needed some support, you took them to the elders. Well, the elders are completely inept. They have no training in any of this anything that that deals with with human emotion, human you need a specialist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, somebody who knows about um, the emotional state, the human mind and the illnesses. I mean, my God, I, I was completely ignorant of mental illness, even though it ran in my family. <clears throat> I grew up in a in a family where there was a lot of violence. There were there were, I had two families. I had the the meeting family, uh, where my mom and dad were were ideal Bible students, uh, jovial, um, uh, social. Um, they knew how to to behave in the context of the meeting, you know, the 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 ecclesia arrangement. But then when we left, they they were totally different people. And my mother was was uh, you, you never knew what was going to enrage her. Um, there were broken plates and brushes that would fly across the room and and uh, screaming slapping across the face and she, you know you didn't know what was gonna set her into a rage and my father had a, a bad temper and if he he, he really didn't want to have anything much to do with the raising of us boys in fact he he tried to unload that on, on onto my shoulders, where I was, you know, you're the oldest. Of, I was the oldest of three boys. Um, and I don't know how many times I could tell you that I, you know, I'm the example. I, I failed at setting the example for my brothers. And so I, I took a lot of responsibility that I didn't want. It wasn't something I wanted. Uh, and I guess inwardly I, I rebelled, um, and and in my rebellion, my father blamed me for my brother's even more extreme behavior, and and so they kept that hid as well as they could from the Bible students, especially when we became teens, and they they weren't uh, as able to to control us or spank us and hit us and punish us in some way but um, I didn't know any different and so many of the, the dysfunctional ideas that, that that I was raised to believe were of value were, were things that I incorporated in, into my own family when I when I started a family with my wife and things escalated uh, after we left the dawn and the the fact that you were in a communal relationship and you had people there that forced your behavior to to conform to Bible student expectations but uh, when you are when when you're on your own, suddenly no one's around. Uh, things kind of would get out of hand, and there would be you know shouting matches and arguments. And and I I really have to pull the greater part of the blame for that because I had 
bad temper and I was using alcohol to um, cope basically with with the stress and it got it, it, it could get turbulent and um, and I, I, I felt my aspirations within the Bible students slipping away and I was blaming my wife for that and it was completely and totally unfair in the end <laughs> she turned out to be right when I when I was devastated uh, when my name came up for elder and I was not elected an elder I was absolutely devastated I think it felt like a, um, a sword had pierced my heart and she tried her best to console me and she said someday you're going to be grateful for the fact that you weren't elected an elder and you know <laughs> she turned out to be right she she was right on in so many ways that that I just couldn't see <laughs> uh, but that didn't help things any and I I um, I ended up with um, uh, circumstances. I, I, I guess what I'm struggling with is how to how to explain the situation without bringing in things that are really somebody else's personal matters and and still try to get the ideas across. But uh, there was uh, a circumstance where one evening I, I came home from work and my wife was gone. The house was dark and the kids were gone. And that never happened. And uh, I, I was just, I mean, I can't, I can't say, I, I mean, I was in a state of shock we we had been struggling for months and months my father had died and I just was out of control and certainly there was no suggestion of psychological help not not for a bible student and so things escalated between us and she ended up making an arrangement with her brother uh, to to move now he he could accommodate her because they had a huge house he he did very well he was a highly successful um, medical doctor and they had room <clears throat> and they were a blended family um, and so she could be the nanny and this was in his mind a permanent arrangement and I thought I had lost my family for good they didn't want uh, my father-in-law and my brother-in-law didn't want me in the, the picture at all um, I thought the, our marriage was over and um, he wouldn't let me talk to her it was it was a full month uh, after they had packed up a moving van actually when I say the house was empty it really was empty uh, there were there were very few things left there was a couple or a few chairs for me to sit on uh, there was a bed uh, I could sleep on and I had the cat <laughs> uh, outside of that um, there wasn't a whole lot of else uh, there was she took most of what was from her family and and could, contribution to our household well <clears throat> um, that was a circumstance that lasted four months but the the interesting thing was that that I went to the elders in distress and they were just complete morons that that they had nothing to offer the two of them came to my house and they just exacerbated the, the whole thing. They they would have exacerbated had I listened 
to their advice they because they were numbskulls really that's that's all they were they certainly not trained in these types of situations and to to for anybody to think that an elder is the appropriate individual to go to is wildly mistaken so for anybody out there listening and you're considering help don't go to an elder I swear don't do it I had two of them come to my home one night and they were just they were anyway <laughs> the irony of the whole thing was that one of my neighbors across the street we, they were all, everybody on this block was Jehovah's Witness, and that's another story in itself. But we moved into a duplex uh, after leaving the dawn into a, a block, a dead-end street that was owned by a Jehovah's Witness who built these duplex homes um, and rented them out. And so everybody on the block except me and the neighbor across the street uh, were Jehovah's Witnesses. So um, that was kind of an unusual situation. <clears throat> and we lived there for 10 years. Um, he was, he's a, a lawyer. Uh, he, his daughter was best friends with my youngest. And we were mildly friendly. I mean, we weren't supposed to be very strongly engaged with the world we but we weren't to be unfriendly either i mean we were in the world uh, but not of it and uh, he was a lawyer and also a professor at a local state college that was two miles up the road and he uh, i knew he was a, a pretty smart fellow and uh, I went over to ask him about legal services, whether or not he knew a good lawyer that I could consult, because I honestly thought our marriage was over. She, she was gone, and I wasn't able to speak with her. And, and uh, this fellow said the... the the best thing that it gave me the best advice that I had ever gotten in my life to that point in time and since. Um, he said, Pete, you don't need, <laughs> you don't need a lawyer. What you need is a counselor. And he gave me the card of somebody he had seen. So I, 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 called up this fellow and he couldn't take me his caseload was too much but he recommended another counselor and I went to this guy for three years well that that began to really impact my life quite a bit and my wife started coming down on weekends uh, from where she was where she had she was staying, uh, which was about a two-hour ride from our home, and um, we were doing things with with the kids together. And uh, that summer, we did more things than I think we ever did in our life. We went to the Museum of Natural History and took the Circle Line around uh, the uh, New York City, and we did kayaking, and there were parties and. We, we, we made that four months she was away a, um, <clears throat> a, a sort of an island experience in our lives that, that we never did before. We did for ourselves. And, and uh, I was getting counseling. I was talking to this guy bi-weekly. I was going to him twice a week. And so <clears throat> things really settled down between us and we, we got back together again. But that, that didn't solve 
the issues. I, I didn't really work at it very hard. Um, I still believed the, the basic values and tenets of the Bible students. And, and um, after about three years, I, I quit counseling with this individual and uh, thinking that, that I could do it on my own. Well, things deteriorated pretty quickly because I really hadn't, hadn't made any real changes. And I, I, be, and I never really did stop with the alcohol. Uh, I, I liked it too much, for one thing. And um, so within a few years' time, uh, family members, key family members uh, passed away. All within a seven-year period, uh, my... my dad, my grandfather, my grandmother, uh, my brother, and my mother all passed away. So all but one brother of my nuclear family as I was growing up, they, they were gone. <clears throat> and my brother's suicide really impacted me quite a bit. And um, my my alcohol consumption became worse my behavior became worse i still believe that the man was the head of the family and it it just created a lot of problems and uh i went out one night and i got a dui and <laughs> i never was so humiliated before i was in fear of losing my job i was in there there were it was it was awful but so was the 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 circumstances uh, there was so much turbulence it was it was uh we were we were really um in in dire straits at that point as a as a family and my older daughter had left home when she was 18 and moved in with a um, boyfriend and um, things were pretty turbulent for our younger daughter. She, she was left behind and um, then the humiliation of me getting a DUI and losing my license and and having to work out an arrangement to get a ride to work and all that, it was just, uh, it was really bad news. Uh, it was, I don't know how we got through that, but I um, had to take a state mandated course or, or actually, it, it actually is mandatory. Um, it's a mandatory program that, that you have to go through. It's called the Drunk Drivers Resource Center, something like that, in New Jersey. And it's a weekend where you, you stay the entire weekend, 48 hours, um, and, and listen to all the information about drug addiction and they educate you about drug addiction, alcohol abuse and and there there were people from AA that um, came and speak spoke at this, this resource center which I find odd because uh, not too long before this the Supreme Court had ruled that AA was a religion and that it um, that that it fell under the separation of church and state, and here the state was permitting uh, AA members to come in and and speak. Well, uh, not knowing better and and thinking that the that the state endorsed the the uh, AA, I decided to join and um, so I, I went from one cult into another AA uses much of the same 
uh, I guess, approach towards their members as the, the Bible students. I felt very comfortable in the AA because it, it was not much of a transition. I mean, the, the meeting structures were the same. They had their own big book, the, the six volumes and, and the, and the, the um, first volume being sort of the, the, uh, the big book of the Bible students. And now you had Bill Wilson's big book uh, that we studied from on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, during meetings, and there were meetings upon meetings. Jeez, I was going to 10 meetings a week, and I, I tried to do it right. I got a sponsor, and, and it became very intrusive. Um, and there were issues that existed within AA as they did with the Bible students and when you stop and you think about it people who abuse drugs and alcohol uh, often are not individuals that uh, are high on the mental health <laughs> spectrum and uh, you, you find uh, many many untreated um, a higher, definitely a higher percentage of untreated people with uh, NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, other um, other disorders that that are um, antisocial, uh, psychopaths, even uh, histrionic, uh, borderline personalities, and uh, all the the whole gamut. You, you could find it in spades uh, in AA and <clears throat> the, the the intrusiveness was was even worse than in the Bible students because men the, the, it was a, it's a much larger organization there are many more local uh, I guess chapters I don't know what you call them now I, I can't remember it's been many years since I associated with them, but um, I I felt guilt initially for for attending a for for um, abandoning my religion for help and that was not part of my religion, but I was going to do it anyway because I needed help. And I also realized that I needed counseling, too. And when I mentioned that with NAA, I, that there were many people that just jumped right on me immediately, saying, that's the wrong thing, don't go counseling, just stay and work the program, it's going to be fine. And it's a shame-based program. I mean, you have to make a literal list of all the things that you've done and that, that how you've hurt other people. And it, it, it's a shame-based style of coercion and, and behavioral control as opposed to changing from within and using cognitive methods to, to uh, alter personality and, 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 and maybe not necessarily personality but at least say behavioral aspects uh, it was all again externally applied it was you know being constantly around people meeting after meeting after meeting and being with people and separating yourself from they use a different term uh, I think it's earth people and um, you you uh, it's like being in the world you know that that kind of terminology uh, so they they separate themselves they have their idols uh, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob and you have even factions within the, the, it's not as severe as uh, let's say the Shiite and uh, you know other Muslims that war against each other but they have the Dr. Bob faction that, that 
believes his approach was better than Bill Wilson's, and I don't. It gets a little wacky, but they had their conventions, and they had. Uh, again, it was very much like the Bible students, and it it was very strongly. Um, in fact, I don't you know. It's I don't know if it was just an irony or not. But the Bible students' ecclesia that I was raised in was only a matter of doors away from in New York City from one of the very first uh, AA halls or AA meetings uh, that that was held by Bill Wilson and I, I I don't know but I don't know if Bill Wilson ever came into contact with the Bible students but the 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 format and the structure is remarkably similar and again we were maybe it's coincidence but uh, our meetings were were only a block away from one of the earliest AA meeting halls. I think the timing was off, though. I don't think they ever existed at the same time. So I I, I can't say that for certain. But um, who knows uh, how how things, you know, who influenced Bill Wilson if he had ever contacted or, or been in the proximity of Bible students, who knows? I, I don't know. There, there's no evidence of it. But anyway, it, it was remarkably similar, and I felt very comfortable with them. And I stayed for five years until the, the cliques and the internal personality conflicts got to the point where it, it just was not a healthy thing any longer um, and it, once again it was my wife who, who noted this uh, well before I did I'd probably still be in it had she not found uh, many of the things about it unhealthy and um by that point, I, I was well into my own individual psycho, you know, psychological therapy. And, and I, I was actually learning things. You know, I, I'm the kind of person that likes to understand why. Why? There, there must be cause to effect. And I guess that probably predisposed me to why I chose physics as a major in, in college because I, I like to know why I was an auto mechanic and uh, I was a fully certified auto mechanic uh, I, I was particularly adept at um, diagnosis at, at solving in fact I, I was the shop's diagnostician uh, every car that came in with a problem ran through me first uh, to diagnose and then sent to a mechanic for repair. And uh, so I, I happened to be pretty good at that kind of thing. And I like to know why things work. That's why physics was so appealing in, in college. And uh, so that was... Um, that was something that, that, again, once again, uh, my wife saw it before I did uh, and, um, and, and made, made it um, really pointed out to me that, that it was not healthy for me to be in there any, any longer. So this time I did not resist. I didn't protest. I... Um, I left, and uh, I've been f fine since. I mean, I the the 
if you believe what AA tells you when you when you're in AA that uh, you're going to incur all of the same problems again you're going to become a full-blown alcoholic and you're dead in fact they even give experiences over and over again uh, where people who have left AA just come the, the problems magnify and multiply um, even worse than than what brought you into AA. So don't leave. You know that's the warning. That scare tactics. Don't leave. And um, while I've been in counseling for since, oh, I don't know. I guess it's been 2004 or 2002. I can't even remember anymore. Uh, it's done a world of good for me to have somebody to talk to and and to iron out issues with me. Uh, and it's it's worked. And I haven't come to rely <laughs> on a crutch. Uh, and and I haven't. My life hasn't fallen apart. In fact, actually, now that. I'm away from both of these things. Um, it, it my life is my life is actually much more quiet, much better. Um, quiet in a sense of turbulence. It's busy in a good way. We we have a very close association with our daughters. We have a very uh, they. In fact, one of them is really trying very hard to get us to move in with them and share a, um, a mother-daughter or duplex type of home uh, because I'm, I'm getting close to retirement and they, they, don't know, they don't want us to move away. They want us to be a part of my grandson's life and all of that wouldn't be if we didn't have a, a good family relationship. And, and certainly a family that's away from all of the crap that these cults, uh, let's say, land on you, you know, compress you. It's like a boulder that you can't move on your back, you know. One interesting thing um, when I left a when I left the Bible students, there were some family members that may have been concerned, but I only received one, maybe two phone calls from Bible students who were concerned about my eternal welfare. I think many of them were glad to be rid of me. Most of them probably, but. Um, with AA, it was another story altogether. When when I left, um, <laughs> the phone rang off the hook for two weeks. I had to literally hide. I mean, because the, the many were within town. I I didn't want to go to the grocery store. Uh, everybody I, I, I ran into, where are you? What have you been doing? What happened? I heard what happened. Blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and uh, I, I got 35 phone calls. Uh, or no, not 35 phone calls. I got 35 different people who called me and asked me to either come back or what was the problem or could they help or you know bring me back into the fold and and um, I had one person uh, banging at the front door uh, we had to hide in our own house uh, and this this person would would refuse to acknowledge that yeah, I had already spoken to her and told her that that uh, why and and why I'm not coming back. I didn't need to to say it again. Uh, she stood there at her front door, dialing her phone and calling our phone number 
um, she refused to leave. She stood there for 10 minutes, banging at the door. And I, I felt like a prisoner in my own home. And so if somebody says it isn't a cult, uh, I, I, I might differ, okay, in my opinion. And some argue AA has helped so many millions of people, and maybe it has. Maybe it stopped a lot of people from drinking, but but I don't think it gets to the root cause of why the drinking began. It was a, a program designed and formulated in 1939 by a layperson who didn't know anything and wasn't trained in the human mind and believed in a spiritual, um, in fact, I think they even had a seance, uh, if I recall. Uh, they believed in spiritism or spirits or something. I don't know. I think his wife may have. Uh, but um, they, they, uh, they weren't trained. You know, the, the early individuals who started this program didn't know anything about psychology and aren't trained in dealing with people and personality issues personality disorders that cause the abuse and um, and uh, so it's it's an archaic an archaic at the time it, it, it was the only thing out there but today there's so many there's so much more understanding about drug addiction that affects it's a disease of the brain there's a genetic predisposition there's so many different aspects that we understand today that AA is sort of an archaic sense at least in its in its full blown measure now as a um, let's say a support group and if that's all it did then that's a different thing but it's not it, it hangs your dirty laundry out for everybody to see. And then everybody knows everybody's dirty secrets, especially the sponsors. And I had been to meetings all over the country because my job took me all over the country. And I looked up AA meetings everywhere I went during that five years I was in. And um, I the meetings all ran the gamut. I mean, I, I, I went to a place up in the uh, Boston area where they wouldn't permit anybody who um, hadn't gone to the ninth step. It's a 12-step program, and they're, each, each step is designed to bring you closer to this perfection than their 12 steps. I don't know why 12. 12 apostles, I don't know. Uh, it is uh, quasi-religion, or maybe, a, according to the Supreme Court, a religion. But um, uh, one one is to to make a uh, a list of of the things that you had done as uh, an alcoholic, and of course, you, you know, with your inhibitions relieved, and and your your judgment impaired, you're going to definitely do things that that have impacted people badly and um, you know to to remind yourself of how bad you are it's not the I don't think the healthiest way to mental health um, and I think understanding those things you know it all too well what you've done you know and I think uh, counseling may probably help you uh, more than than being shamed into a laundry list of of wrongs that you've done other people and then making amends to those uh, individuals i think any person who's wronged somebody and has got any sense of you know a, a conscious uh you know is a conscientious uh person uh, will make amends to those whom they hurt and I think usually it's family members the most especially deserving I think it's a little odd when somebody comes out of the blue that hasn't been in your life for 20 years and you 
you suddenly pop up and said, I'm sorry for something that, that you know, my God, I don't even remember that circumstance. Um, so that, 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 and that happens, that does happen. I went to a, a meeting in Boston where, like I said, they wouldn't let anybody who hadn't made the, up to the ninth step, cleared the ninth step, allowed to share in the meeting. And uh, I was a visitor, and, and so I, they didn't know what step I was at, so I, I shared anyway. But um, there was one individual who shared, and I don't know if this typified this particular group, but this guy had, he was talking about uh, one of his sponsees' fourth steps, and it was 180 pages long, and and had a, t- a table of contents and an index in it. <laughs> the damn thing was like ready for publishing, and uh, <laughs> I, I I thought, you know, that's a little on the extreme side. So you 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 find this sort of thing in AA and why you know why it's it's not really beneficial to just humiliate somebody and rub their nose in the wet spot on the floor that they made you know like a training a puppy you know uh, that, that it's it's not a uh, it's not a healthy approach i don't think i think there are better ways and I know in an early iteration of Stephen Hassan's website, um, what is that? Uh, I can't think of it. Stephen Hassan uh, had been inducted into the, or drawn or captured or seduced into the Moonies and, 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 um, he was literally, literally kidnapped back out of the of the Moonies by his parents, and um, he's devoted the rest of his life to the work of helping people in cults. And initially, he had, at least in an early iteration, of a website that that he sponsors as part of his work um, had a list of groups that that were considered cult or cultish and um, certainly Jehovah's Witnesses were among it and and uh, Scientology and and a lot of others that you would never heard of at least I never heard of them. I'm not in the business of looking up cults. But uh, AA was uh, explicitly listed. Um, I don't think it's so explicitly listed now because I think there may have been some repercussions or, let's say, blowback from that. But they identify 12-step programs more loosely. And and I think that they... they, they kind of sit in that that quasi almost border area of of qualifying as a as a um, as a cult and and when you stop and you think about it at first they they emphasize a a spiritual aspect that a higher that a higher power exists higher than yours well when you're an atheist then that 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 kills you right there. I I known people to go in in AA to 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 consider their pet turtle, literally their pet turtle as a um, as a uh, their higher power, and that's absurd. Come on, that drives people to absurdities uh, because it's a must. It's so strongly emphasized, and uh, again, there's a the fact that it is such an intrusive everybody knows everybody's 
business everybody you know you miss a meeting why did you miss the meeting you know you can't miss that meeting you're 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 um, volunteered into all sorts of functions if not as secretary for some committee you are uh, you know required or almost required to go to something like um, oh, there were these retreats these um, I I, I, I can't even think of the name now and I went to five of these retreats no more than that maybe seven or eight um, damn anyway it's uh, some some Catholic monk and I I it was held at a at, at a convent you know it was, used to be a 1920s hotel in the uh, in the uh, Poconos, and uh, you know, I just got this weird feeling being in this this Catholic. Very, uh, it's not that I have anything against Catholics per se, but but the the culture there with all the Jesuses and Marys and the doors. Each room was named Mary, Queen of Peace, and this and that. You know, I mean naming the rooms and the furniture was steel you know very spartan <laughs> even the, the chairs were made out of steel and um, every they had a little catholic gift shop and you you they had a, a priest come in and um, and and take your confession of course i i wasn't going to confess do a confession uh, i was already confessing with my fourth step so these are the types of things that there's a, a great deal of group pressure to do these things that that force you to participate into uh, the, the the activities in the group and to isolate yourself from other activities and uh, it, it does separate you from the world. In a way, that's their M.O. Uh, in, in separating you, you can't get drunk because if you stay in our... Well, I don't want to live an isolated life where I feel guilty or uncomfortable um, outside the confines of some inner circle that, that's protecting me. I, I, I don't like that feeling and I like the feeling of being being free to do and think and, and act and go without you know making sure that if you go on vacation you you better look up some meetings wherever you go you know come on that's you know that's not your business and that's not my you know it's my prerogative and so I'm, I I feel that it is a little on top when I say that I, I kind of say that with reservation I'm uh, I might say it, I should say it maybe a little strongly but anyway that's a that was my experience with them so when I say I went from one cult to another it I, I believe I did and um, I think you can be prone to that because you're used to a certain environment and and way uh, culture let's say around you and and living a certain way you know you're raised in this this the, the confines of the bible students or the jehovah's witnesses or whatever organization it is and, and I think that it makes you more vulnerable to psychologically, especially if you don't get help from a, a good independent counselor who, who understands that, that there may be aspects of AA that aren't healthy for you. So um, that's my perspective. And I, it's... You know, opening up aspects of my life that uh, could be helpful. The, 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 the problem 
is that there I I wish I could fully disclose everything about my life but I can't because I don't want to hurt other people there are other people's rights uh, to privacy that that I might infringe uh, opening up in the full details I'm doing the best I can at, at trying to keep this really centered around my experience but my experience is intertwined very strongly with other individuals and I, boy do I have some doozies <laughs> I'm sure there are individuals uh, but I think for some reason I've been cursed uh, with, with uh, some very unusual ex- circumstances I mean um, literally have um, a, a close well let's say a, there, there was a motion a major motion picture film made about an experience uh, or was at least inspired by an experience of somebody very close to me and I can't reveal the details even though it's been public and it, it, it made the news um, in fact it was front page news because they are very close family members and I can't I, I just don't feel right to disclose this information but it did impact my life and and help with the dysfunction that existed in my life and unfortunately I, I don't feel free to disclose these things but um, uh, maybe someday I wish I wish I could uh, but um, it, it makes for a, f- a fascinating uh, a fascinating story much more interesting than, than my story so anyway I, I hope this may explain a comment I made and um, and uh, I hope it's beneficial to those of you who um, may be considering uh, these sort of self-help organizations. They, I, I don't. I think. Uh, I think there's there there are much better ways of of, of getting help. So. Anyway, um, until next time.